betraying his oath and our nation's security. The battle begins. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi officially launches an impeachment inquiry, saying President Trump's actions have seriously violated the Constitution. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. Trump now the fourth president ever to face proceedings this serious after confirming that he encouraged Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden. The president calls the inquiry a witch hunt, a huge showdown now set. Our powerhouse team breaks it all down this morning. Also this morning, Twister touched down, multiple tornadoes tearing across the Midwest overnight. And now the Southwest bracing for monsoon storms. The dramatic drug bust caught on camera. Hey, we need to get them all over on a boat. The Coast Guard taking down smugglers in the submarine, seizing tens of millions of dollars in cocaine. Shark Tank trouble. The star's wife now charged in a deadly boating accident. The Demi Moore exclusive, telling Diane Sawyer about the moment she hit rock bottom. Is an ambulance on the way? The party, the drugs. Everyone else was witnessing my body flailing. Um, my daughter terrified that she was going to see me die right in front of her. How she finally got help and her message of hope that you'll hear only on GMA this morning. And when Archie met the Archbishop, the adorable new images this morning of the youngest royal making his huge debut. Live in Times Square, this is Good Morning America. Good morning, America. Let's get right to that historic news from Capitol Hill. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing a formal impeachment inquiry of President Trump. Only three other American presidents have faced impeachment proceedings this serious. Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton survived in office. Richard Nixon resigned. How it will play out for President Trump, the big unknown right now. Here's what we do know right now. The impeachment inquiry is centered on President Trump's phone call with the leader of Ukraine. Now the question, did the president pressure him to investigate political rival Joe Biden? The White House now says it will release a transcript of the call as early as this morning, but de Democrats want more. They want to hear from the whistleblower who uncovered this all. That whistleblower has offered to testify. That would be part of the investigation. The stakes are enormous. A constitutional and political clash with national security consequences. The inquiry likely to peak at the launch of the presidential election year. That has never happened before. Our senior congressional correspondent Mary Bruce starts us off from Capitol Hill. Good morning, Mary. George, good morning. This is a momentous shift that we could not have seen coming just a week ago. After resisting this move for months, the House Speaker now says the president violated the Constitution and betrayed our national security. And now in just a short time, the next step in what is sure to be this epic battle, the White House releasing the transcript of that phone call at the center of this controversy. This morning, the stage is set for an historic clash between Congress and the president after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced that stunning first step towards impeachment. The House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. Accusing him of betraying the office of the president. The actions of the Trump presidency revealed the dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. The president responding on Twitter, calling it more breaking news witch hunt garbage and presidential harassment. They're going to lose the election and they figure this is a, a thing to do. They all say that's a positive for me from the election. After months of hesitation, Pelosi making her move as scores of Democrats demanded action. We cannot delay. We must not wait. The tipping point? The president's own admission that he withheld military aid from Ukraine just days before he encouraged the president of Ukraine to investigate his potential 2020 rival, Joe Biden, and Biden's son who had business interests in Ukraine. The president of the United States has admitted that he spoke to the president of a foreign country, that would be Ukraine, about uh, something that would assist him in his political, uh, in his election. So that has changed everything. Trump insists halting the aid to Ukraine was not an attempt to pressure the Ukrainian president. And there was never any quid pro quo. But Democrats say that doesn't matter. You don't need an explicit quid pro quo. You don't need an implicit quid pro quo. Ukraine understands how it is entirely dependent on the United States. This morning, Trump is planning to release the unredacted transcript of that call with the Ukrainian president at the center of this controversy. That call was perfect. It couldn't have been nicer. There was no pressure put on them whatsoever. 
That call was part of a whistleblower complaint that the inspector general found to be of urgent concern and credible. But the director of national intelligence decided not to turn it over to Congress. And now both parties are calling for the complaint to be released. Now, in a rare moment of unity here on the Hill, all of the Senate Republicans joined their Democratic colleagues in passing a resolution calling for the release of that whistleblower complaint. But Republicans, George, have also been very quick to denounce Speaker Pelosi in this move to impeach. They say Democrats are playing pure politics and rushing to judgment. So far, they appear to be unified on that. Okay, Mary, thanks very much. Robin? And George, President Trump says he's authorized the release of the transcript of that call with the president of Ukraine. Let's bring in our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, in Washington. Pierre, the release could come at any moment now. Robin, good morning. We could see it soon with the transcript being released as early as today. The president tweeted yesterday that he had authorized the full release of the transcripts after declassifying the material. So President Trump continues to maintain that he did nothing wrong, basically nothing that bad to see here, he says. But critics want to know if he truly suggested to the president of Ukraine that he should investigate his political rival, Joe Biden, and or his son. Looks like we get some answers today, Robin. But what do we know, Pierre, about the whistleblower? We still don't know the identity of this person, but we learned overnight the whistleblower is an official in the intelligence community. And we now know that the whistleblower wants to meet with the House Intelligence Committee, but matters are complicated because the acting director of national intelligence and Justice Department blocked the whistleblower's complaint from being shared with Congress. But the politics changed dramatically overnight, as Mary said, with all those 100 senators voting to say to the administration, give Congress the darn complaint. And we're getting indications that the White House is contemplating sharing the complaint possibly as early as this week. But Robin, it's a very fluid situation because the intelligence community, Inspector General, found that the whistleblower's allegations were credible and of urgent concern. Well, as you just mentioned, the acting director of national intelligence is really in the hot seat. That's right. He's due, uh, Joseph McGuire is due to appear on the Hill in an open hearing tomorrow. And as grillings go on Capitol Hill, this could be white hot. They want that whistleblower complaint, and they want to know why they were initially blocked from getting the complaint in the first place, Robin. All right, Pierre, thank you. Michael? All right, Robin, we're going to bring in our chief White House correspondent, John Carl, with the latest on how the Trump administration is reacting to all this. Good morning, John. Good morning. Well, we've seen a mixture of anger and defiance from the president. You know, he came out with those same words, Michael, that he used with the Mueller investigation. It's a witch hunt. It's presidential harassment. And he also was saying, they tell me it's going to help my campaign. And in fact, within an hour, less than an hour after Pelosi came out, the Trump campaign was out with an email trying to raise money on this, saying, join the impeachment defense team. Brad Parscale, the campaign manager, had this to say, uh, the misguided Democratic impeachment strategy is meant to appease their rabid extreme leftist base, but will only serve to embolden and energize President Trump's supporters and create a landslide victory for the president. But I got to tell you, Michael, talking to people very close to the president, uh, they tell me that he does not want this. This spooks him. This is something mm -hmm. he does not want on his legacy. The speed with which this happens. I mean, think about it. Mueller investigated for, uh, you know, two years. And this story, less than a week after it broke, creates this move towards impeachment. I think that spooked the president. And, and this is a stain on his legacy if this goes through. If you look at Nancy Pelosi's words, Nancy Pelosi wasn't simply uh, making the case for an impeachment inquiry, for mm -hmm. an investigation. Nancy Pelosi was making the case for impeaching the president, Nancy. saying he broke the law and saying that he had betrayed his oath of office. And no one's above the law is what she's that's, trying to say. That's but exactly. it's not going to go down without a fight. Uh, he will go. He's fought a lot before, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, John, thank you so much. We've got a George okay, over here. Okay, guys, let's take a step back and look at how this impeachment process could all play out. The speakers authorized six House committees to investigate President Trump for impeachable offenses. Those committees are gathering evidence, holding hearings. They're going to send their strongest cases to the Judiciary Committee. That committee will have the lead role in drafting possible articles of impeachment and voting on whether to send them to the full House for a final vote. If a majority of the House, which is controlled by Democrats, approve those charges, the president is impeached, which is the equivalent of an indictment. Then the whole process moves to the Senate, which is supposed to hold a trial. Each side chooses lawyers to make their case. Chief Justice John Roberts would preside, and the senators would act as the jury. It would take two-thirds of the Senate, 67 votes, to convict and remove President Trump from office. That would mean at least 20 Republican senators would have to vote to convict, which looks unlikely right now. Only two presidents have ever been impeached, Andrew Johnson in 1868, Bill Clinton in 1998. 
Both survived trial in the Senate and stayed in office. Richard Nixon also faced impeachment, but he resigned in 1974 when it was clear the House would impeach and the Senate was almost certain to convict. Let's talk about this now with Chris Christie, our contributor, Dan Abrams, our chief legal analyst. So let's just start out. How serious is this threat to President Trump? Well, uh, listen, anytime uh, someone, something like this happens, it's a serious threat. I, I will tell you that everything I've been hearing now in the last 20 hours out of the White House is that um, they think that this is not going to amount to what uh, the reaction that they've gotten from the Democrats. They feel like they're overreacting to this. They are now saying they're releasing the transcript unredacted today. They're saying they're going to release the whistleblower complaint and allow the whistleblower to talk to the committees of Congress. Um, and, and I will tell you, I don't see it as a, a seismic kind of reaction that they're having. But, but if the President of the United States was encouraging a foreign leader to investigate a political rival, that is arguably an impeachable offense, isn't well, it? Well, we have to look at what the context is, George, right? So, for instance, if he's saying, um, listen, do me a favor, you know, in, you know, go investigate Joe Biden, that's one thing. If he's saying, listen, I'm concerned about corruption, you've just gotten elected, we send hundreds of millions of dollars over there, you need to start looking at this. For instance, one of the things that occurred was the Hunter Biden situation. That becomes totally different. So what I'd say to everybody is, let's take a breath, let's read the transcript, and let's read the whistleblower complaint, and then we're going to be able to make some real judgments here. I think the mistake the speaker made was that she jumped at this that quickly when she's been the one who's been the most calm throughout and she's admitted herself that she hasn't seen either the transcript or the complaint. So how serious is this and how does it strengthen the hand of the House? Well, first I would just say it would be an odd example to use, right? I mean, Chris is suggesting that the president uh, may have just used it as an example that, oh, you know, one of the things you might look into is Hunter Biden. I mean, that's the same thing as saying, in effect, you ought to look into that. Now, that doesn't necessarily make when it When he knows that they, that country wants military aid. It, 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 exactly. So, I mean, you know, look, this happens in trials all the time. It's th there's no specific comment, you ought to do this. There's just the suggestion and the implication, et cetera. But as a legal matter, look, does this move things significantly yet? Not really. It moves it a little bit. The closer you can get to a quasi-judicial proceeding, the stronger the argument of the Congress is, meaning they're still trying to get documents, they're still trying to get people to testify, but they've been already trying to do that. And you know what? They already have pretty strong arguments in terms of getting these people there. The fundamental question is going to be, does this expedite the process? Will the court say, now that there's an impeachment inquiry, we need to move and things along faster? And that will more material. One of the other big questions the House is going to have to face, and I want to put this to each of you, if they decide to go forward with impeachment, is how broad or narrow right. to make the articles of Really important, because, listen, I think that the American and people in general, by a majority, have kind of rejected the Mueller package, as I would call it. They don't see it as impeachable. I think there's a lot of members in the House who we know obviously feel differently. So how is Nancy Pelosi going to be able to discipline this? Is she going to keep it narrow to what we're talking about with Ukraine this morning when they get more information, if it warrants it? Or is she going to blow this open and let everything up? If they do, I think that's even bitter, bigger political risk for the Democrats. So. Let's always remember, too, Dan and I are talking about the legal side of this, but this, as you know, is a political fundamentally process. Fundamentally political. It's fundamentally but, but, political. There are no standards. Yeah, but using legal phrases, right, and, yeah. and legal terminology, and in both the, the, uh, the Nixon and Clinton cases, they went broad. There were a lot of different kinds of impeachable offenses, and I think Chris is right that here they're going to want to keep it more narrow. They're going to keep it focused. Will it necessarily be just this issue with Ukraine? Who knows? The, the one final point I want to make, though, is that this is a dynamic process. Once it gets started, once the hearings get started, you don't know what's going to get Well, of course not, because you don't know how, what, how witnesses are going to react, what they're going to say, how they're going to perform in front of Congress, and how the American people will react. But you're but still going to have the fights over who should testify, the yeah. same fights we're having and, today. And, and, you'll, and you'll remember this, too, really important. You know the president doesn't want this to happen, but what he will do is make Joe Biden the issue here. Of we course. know that. Yeah. He will try. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Let's go to Robin. And Georgia, of course, we're going to be following the latest developments all morning long. But now we're going to turn to the morning's other top stories, starting with those tornadoes tearing across the Midwest overnight. Ginger has those details for us. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning to all of you. And good morning. Looking at these pictures out of Chippewa County, Wisconsin, you can see that there was tor a tornado there. We know that there were at least five reported tornadoes all the way back to Kansas. Winds in excess of 80 miles per hour and flash flooding. I think that that risk 
starts to diminish today with that system, but down in the southwest, it's a totally different story. We've got this Pacific tropical moisture fueling up. We've got a mid-level low that's going to kind of amp up the atmosphere and get the convection going. So the southern end there, especially Yuma, we start seeing that by this afternoon and evening. An inch or two can very quickly flood anyone, even just south of Las Vegas. So we'll be watching for up to three inches to eventually fall. Michael. All right, thank you, Ginger. Now to new developments in that dramatic murder trial underway in Dallas. We're now seeing body cam video from the night a police officer killed her neighbor, claiming she mistook his apartment for her own. Marcus Moore is in Dallas with the latest. Good morning, Marcus. Well, Michael, good morning. Jurors watched this uh, dramatic video, this chilling body cam video that shows officers in their desperate scramble to reach the fourth floor of the Southside Flats in Dallas. It's the night Amber Geiger shot 26-year-old Botham John. For the first time, jurors and the public are seeing the chaos of that night in real time. Officers sprinting down a long hallway and finding a distressed Amber Geiger. At the time, Geiger was a fellow officer, taking first responders to her fatally injured neighbor. Several officers immediately taking turns performing CPR, trying desperately to save John. But prosecutors are seemingly using other videos to suggest Geiger received preferential treatment from her colleagues. She's having somebody now? Yes. At one point, allowed to sit in a patrol car, at times looking at her phone as John is rushed to the hospital where he died. Geiger's attorneys say she mistakenly went to the wrong floor of her apartment building after an almost 14-hour workday. When she walked into what she thought was her home, she says she believes Jean was an intruder and opened fire. But prosecutors spent day two of the trial trying to portray Geiger as reckless, pressing one responding officer about the protocol when an officer believes there's a burglary in progress. What do you do? You cover concealment. Is that because of the sanctity of human life? Yes, sir. And we expect another busy day in trial as prosecutors could potentially call more neighbors to testify about what they saw and heard and also forensics experts. Robin? A lot of people are watching this case. All right, Marcus. So we're going to end on a, this half hour on a little bit of lighter note. Two major league games that went majorly long. The Diamondbacks facing off against the Cardinals last night in a 19 inning showdown. Yeah, the Diamondbacks won that one, Michael. And then the Giants took on the Rockies. Their game, oh, it just went 16 innings. Oh, but it did set a record because combined they used, are you ready for this? 25 pitchers. 25 pitchers. Colorado I didn't know they had that many. <laughs> Between the two, Colorado Everybody took a shot. <laughs> the Rockies won on a three-run homer. We are following a lot of other stories this morning, including that new trouble for Shark Tank star Kevin O'Leary. His wife is now facing charges. And Demi Moore's darkest point, the actress telling Diane Sawyer about the night her, her daughter was terrified that she'd lose her mom and how she turned her life around. It's an ABC News exclusive, and Diane will be back joining us in our next half hour. But let's go back to Ginger. Yes, and let's talk about the flash flooding in Puerto Rico from what was Tropical Storm Karen. Yes, they had two to four inches of rain, and remember, remember with that topography, it can cause that very quickly. Luckily, all of the threat there is north of them now, and we are watching all of the others. Jerry Lorenzo, even a tropical wave, but no immediate threat to land of any of these. We are so grateful because even Karen, that was going to try and sit over the open ocean and try to turn back west, is looking like it may even dissolve. We're, of course, going to keep you on top of all of it, but your local weather will come up in 30 seconds. First, we've got the Summer Lake Cities, sponsored by Sensodyne. What patients don't realize is what they eat and drink is likely acidic, and then what's happening is the weakening of enamel. Now is the perfect time for a toothpaste-like pro-enamel repair. This toothpaste takes it to the next level. It takes minerals and it drives it deep into the tooth surface so that we can actively help repair weakened enamel. I do think dentists are going to want to recommend pro-enamel repair toothpaste. It's such an easy answer and it will do exactly what their patients need. A cool start on this Wednesday, but warming very quickly. It will go from the 50s and 60s to the 70s by late morning. Your noontime temperature 77 and then 83 at 4 p.m. So it'll feel really nice today, but we need the rain. And we'll have a very slight chance of seeing a shower or thunderstorm Thursday during the afternoon with the next weather maker that comes through. It'll bump our temperature up close to 90 degrees on Thursday, but then right back down for Friday and then back up to the 90s this upcoming weekend with a straight shower or storm.
and the Diane Sawyer is going to join us live in our next half hour. Come on back. I knew my daughter could be at risk of certain cancers later in life. From an infection, human papillomavirus. I knew that HPV could lead to certain cancers. I knew...